Welcome to the Hodget and Freya Show with your host, Hodget and Freya. Hey, Hodget. How's it going, man? Hey, Freya. What's up? What's up? Nothing much, dude. How's it, uh, how's it going up there in Vermont? It's hot. It's Is like it 90, really? It's, yeah, it was like 87 or something today. It's, it's hot. Like, yes, it was hot, too. Whoosh. Dude, the other day, the uh, it was hot. it was like in the nineties, but with the humidity and whatever, it was like they said it felt like it was hundred and five. Oh my god! Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, this is really hot. <laughs> like I'm walking, I have about like a five minute walk from my car to the office building. Oh my and god! I was like, this is horrible right now. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah, I try to go for walks at uh, at work. You know, outside of the and the, we got a nice area called the green and walkways and trees and all that. So That's I try cool. to do it like in the morning as much as I can, because is the the later you go, it is just like oh my god. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Because you... then, then you're soaked. You know, you you come back inside now it's air conditioning and you like feel like ah, you know, all yep. yucky and stuff. Yeah, oh, I used to take walks around uh, our office building and the the the, um, the neighborhood that we're in. But like a, a couple of weeks ago, I just stopped because it was so freaking hot out. I was sweating yeah. and we have a shower and everything in our office for uh, oh, use really? and stuff like that. And so some people will go out, do a workout and then shower and stuff like that. But I'm like, man, that just takes too much time. That's effort. That's a lot of effort. Exactly. Then you got to yeah. like, oh, I I forgot soap and like I don't want to deal with that. I finally I finally got my pool uh, cleaned up and stuff. So my my younger daughter has uh, has been uh, using it. So it was like she's I said what was it today? She says oh the pool's at eighty today. I'm like holy cow that's bath water. Whoa. Yeah, yeah eighty degrees for a pool. So that's crazy. And then speaking of temperatures, I saw a friend of mine uh, who works in uh, Kuwait and. Um, he he posted a picture of uh, his temperature reading in his car in Kuwait. It was like 50, 53 Celsius or something. Oh, man. Like, oh, my freaking God. So he had a picture of snow in London because that's that's where he lives. That's where his family lives. And he works in Kuwait. And he goes back and forth. And it was like 50. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> that's brutal. It's, the inside of my car gets so hot. I, I have a Tavatronics um, windshield attachment to hold my phone. It the comes rubber off. melted. No, it, dude, the rubber melted. Oh. It like dripped down the windshield. <laughs> like I'm like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. So I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. Um, but yeah, it gets it gets toasty. Um, speaking of pools, um, I'm gonna turn this light on because it's getting dark over here. The um, I was talking to one of my friends at work. He um, he actually put together um, a pool at his house. Instead of paying a uh, contractor to, to do all the work, he actually did a lot of the manual labor. Oh. So digging it with an excavator, and they bought a lining and to put it in and stuff like that. That's so he, uh, <laughs> he decided to go with a saltwater pool, oh. which I just assumed, I had heard about this before, I had assumed that it was just like ocean water or something like that but it's it's not so there's still chlorine in the water but yeah. um there is this process of like where um the 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 chlorine is attached to the salt i guess the sodium chloride and when it goes through the process it gets released um and it you know gets diffused into the water or something like that keeping it clean the mm. chlorine keeps it you know, and that way you don't have to, in a regular pool, the chlorine has to get attached, the molecule, I'm sorry, yeah, it has to get, the atom has to get attached to something that is like a carrier, otherwise it just, you know, can't do what it needs to do. I'm not a chemist, I don't know all the right wordings and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so, there, so, so. I know two types of pools, so one, the one I have is a, I use a sand filter, so I've got a traditional style filtering system, a pump, and then, right, so I use Chlor uh, uh, shock, right? Which is okay. really high concentrated chlorine, and you know, a couple of bags or so of that, and then that does the job. And um, and then other people have this thing called it's more 
chemical type of filtering. So they don't have a sand filter, but they use these cartridges and, you know, um, probably something like what you're talking about. That's um, maybe that's what it is. That's could be the, the type of. Yeah, he described it as, you know, when you take a swim in my pool, when you get out, it's as though you've taken a shower. Okay. But when you are swimming in a traditional pool, you need to take a shower after that to get all the gunk. Oh, off, I see. Okay. You know, and because this, yeah, I was like, oh, that is really interesting. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah, man. Like the, when he, I'm like, holy cows, you, I, you I'm built your own you, pool. That's awesome. Regardless, maintaining a pool is a pain. It's, sure. Especially like, you know, the, when you're closing for winter and then trying to open it up. So in the winter time, you know, you get all the stuff that goes in and, uh, you know, bugs and leaves and all that. And then, you know, before you can try to open the pool, you know, by the time you open it, the sun's hitting it daily and stuff. The stuff starts rotting. The pool starts t turning color into like, because you start getting, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, algae and all that stuff. And uh, then it takes you a couple of weeks just to, you know, because you can put in as much of chlorine you want, but the problem is the chlorine is actually eating up that stuff. So it's not really doing any justice to the water. It's like oh, wow. attacking the debris. You know, yeah. So you have to clean and chlorine, clean chlorine. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a lot of work. Oh, it's mm -hmm. a lot. Cool. I'll probably end up shutting it down once the uh, the kids are all done with it. I I hear a lot of parents do that. Once the kids are done, then we're done. Yeah. So anyway, so what else is going on? What's new? Um, I think we have some. Hey, relatively wait. new. Oh wait, what? So we got we that that couple of people that have left their their longtime positions, once from Microsoft and one from Apple that we heard from today. So, well, the first shocking one is Gabe Powell, right, from Microsoft, mm -hmm. and he was a he was a guy who ran uh, the Windows Insider program for the longest time until Donna Sarkar uh, took over. Um, and he was he was great. He was you know I, I knew him from the Windows Insider times mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I yeah I can't remember how long he's been there like almost thirty years, twenty five years or something. Holy cow, that's crazy. Like long time, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's gone. Guess where he's gone to? Facebook. Facebook, right, right. And uh, yeah, um, that's well, another. They need. They definitely need an insider pro program over there. They do need an insider <laughs> program for that. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, maybe something he'll he'll come up with. But his title on on LinkedIn, he's he's a vice president. It just says vice president. Okay. On Facebook. So God knows what it is, right? Well, he he's a smart dude. I'm sure he's going to be Very doing smart. something pretty cool. So. Yeah. And then the other guy is I can't even pronounce his name. Uh, was it from Apple today? John Ives. John Ivy, Ive, Ive, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But he seemed, he was also there for, oh, he's still there, actually. He's leaving at the end of the year. Yep. Um, but he's been there for 30 years, or just about 30 years. And I didn't realize he was the key designer for most of the products, like the iPhones, iPods, iMacs, and all that fun stuff. Even yep. Apple stores, he designed all of those, apparently. Yep. He so, had a lot to do with the uh, <laughs> modern interface as well, yeah. you know, to give it that flat look and everything. Right. Um, yeah, he definitely has a good eye on stuff like that. So when I saw that, I'm like, holy cow, that's a big deal. But his first client is Apple. So. Yeah, <laughs> he's starting his new company. He's not going anywhere. Apparently, he's starting his own company. And there's another guy from his design team is going with him as well. Okay. So whatever this... The name of the company is uh, Love From or something like that. Love From. Okay. And uh, but it doesn't mention like what it is and what they're going to be doing. Gotcha. But apparently the first client is already going to be Apple. So. That's wild. So I think, you know, I, think, I yeah. as we're talking about this, I kind of wonder like, I don't know what their salaries are and stuff like that. But I'm like, do you have to keep working? <laughs> like, I mean, millions. like I. I, I don't know. I have no idea what they make, you know. Um, but like, I would think like, you know, John from Apple, because of the influence he had, he probably has a pretty good nest egg going on after that. So like, oh, yeah. but I mean, that just shows our drive as a species, right? We just need to 
do keep doing something. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. <clears throat> to, keep very interesting. Like, yeah. Keep, keep doing stuff, right? Yeah. Sure. And uh, that's cool. So what else? Well, you got some stuff you wanted to share. Yeah, um, I thought this was interesting. Um, two things. Um, if you're running Exchange server, there was a couple of cumulative updates that came out last week. Yeah. And uh, if you're in hybrid mode with Office 365, this is even more important because you need to be within, I think, three, two or three cumulative updates. With You have to be within the latest two or three cumulative updates to be fully supported by Office 365 and Microsoft support. Um, okay. You kind of, so that's important. Like if you're behind and something happens, the first thing they're going to tell you to do is you need to get on the latest cumulative update. And okay. some infrastructures are more complex than others. It might take you a while to do that. So now that you know that it's out there, start thinking about, all right, how am I going to start deploying this into your production? environments um so it's different for each version it's a different different cumulative update number so right. just look up look up what you have and then you'll see what's going on there well, that's, that's a yep. good tip yeah yep so speaking of updates uh one thing we've discovered is that uh windows 10 1903 right the latest uh build of windows uh windows 10 uh what happens is uh it's got some issues with bitlocker with mbam so okay. if you have, if you're using MBAM, right, the MDOP uh, uh, client, and uh, it will actually, uh, when you're trying to uh, use the uh, MBAM client UI, which actually launches and says, okay, you know, encrypt, uh, it, it, it'll fail. It'll say cannot encrypt, there's an error, and you're like, what the heck's going on, right? And because it used to work before. So if if machines that have been encrypted before mm -hmm. with MBAM and then you did an upgrade, it sh still should be fine. It, the, you know the 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 BitLocker stuff should be fine. But if you are uh, you know you freshly imaged a machine, you put 1903 and then uh, you try to you know run MBAM, it it you'll have this problem. There is a, uh, a hot fix. Um, there, there, a lot of people are complaining about this. By the way, it's out, it's out there. It's the, it's a known issue. Um, there's a they call it the May servicing, May 2019 servicing update. It's something like that. It's like a hot fix. Okay. So you run that, and then that fixes that error, and then it'll let you encrypt your devices. So Got it. that's something. Yeah, something we discovered. Like what? What's going on? This used to work. That's so, weird. Interesting. Yeah, it's only 1903. It's not happening with 1809 or anything other, any other. Uh, so I'm not sure whether this is like, a, is it a bug or is it, um, you know, because I know they're trying to get away, uh, move away from MBAM, right? They try mm -hmm. to uh, deprecate that and, and that's going to be ported into Config Manager and, and things like that. So yep. I don't know, but that's, yeah. Cool. That's a good thing to know. Yeah. Um. The other thing I found was there was a recent announcement on from the Azure folks that there is a preview where Microsoft is adding full IPv6 support for Azure VNets. And this is cool because if you have IPv6 deployed internally, you can now extend that out to your Azure VNets and stuff okay. like that, um, which I'm like, all right, that's cool. That's, you know, definitely thinking ahead. Um, it must be a an ask from Microsoft customers for this functionality. So I thought that was a very interesting, it wasn't really highly publicized either. Okay. Um, it just <clears throat> so I thought that was a, a neat little uh, announcement that was made uh, a couple days ago. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And you guys, are, um, you guys are still uh, an AWS and Azure shop, right? We're because working you... on being all three. So the three big ones, Google Cloud oh. and AWS and Azure. Oh, so wow. we, have, okay. yep, we have some production stuff in Azure, Azure, how do you say it? I don't know, uh, now. Um, and as we kind of more formalize the uh, frameworks and stuff like that, you know, I'm sure we'll get more customers in there. Okay, okay. Yep. And speaking of, I know we had this discussion <laughs> offline about um, and you, you know, we were talking about exchange and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. 
we you talked about the different tenants that you guys have in um especially in the education space and how testing and stuff is done you know you should you should mention some, some stuff about that yeah i mean we have a test beta and then production architecture um, for office 365 for everything right um, including office 365 right yep and so our test infrastructure which is a you know active directory exchange sql stuff it connects is a hybrid with a test tenant and then we got a beta thing which is a little bigger with more servers um, more data coming in and out of it with also with another tenant um, and then we finally have our production stuff and okay. you know in in relation to office 365 you know we don't we try not to turn stuff on right away because we need to see what the impact is and is okay. it are we being compliant with the various, you know, um, laws of the state and stuff like that? And uh, is it also creating additional behavior that we don't want that's going to cause more work or headaches for users? So we've, you know, we will see if we can even just turn it on and test what's that like and then test. It's easy to blow away and recreate and stuff like that. Our beta is more like you know it, it's easy to blow away and rebuild and stuff like that but it's bigger and so it would take more time but yeah. that's where we kind of like come up with okay here's the process to do it and then is it repeatable um and things like that and then we kind of let things bake in there for a bit and then finally we'll do that on a small scale in production and then finally open it up to oh, i see okay everything so oh, yep cool. so we do that with our patches that's um, the right way of doing it though yeah Yep, it takes longer to get things, not much longer, it takes longer. But it's safer. Exactly. Yeah, you, so. you avoid disasters, which will take up even more time sure. you know, to recover and stuff. Yeah, so that's good. Especially if you have like a complicated infrastructure where like if you have um, SQL databases that are always mm -hmm. on and exchange DAGs and stuff like that, you want to get the whole process down for failing things over, patching, and then doing it on the next node, bringing right. the other one back. And, you know, like, and so having this kind of tiered or um, not really tiered, but like, you know, siloed way mm -hmm. of doing it, you, you get that down and then you get it documented. And finally for production, it's just like, okay, we're, we've already done this twice right. at least. So let's, uh, let's go do it. Right, right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, oh, yeah. So do you, you guys have print service? I'm sure we do. I don't have okay. anything to do with them. Thank goodness. I maintain, I maintain like about four, about five print servers, and we're talking about hundreds, hundreds of printers. It's crazy. Oh my god! And I was just talking to one of the IT guys who works for one of the other colleges or departments in the in the university, and he was telling me the number of printing jobs that people do in his. His um, college is on freaking bully on a weekly basis. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like seriously, that that many? We're talking about boxes and boxes. Like in this day and age, like really, you know, with the technology we have, with you know, uh, PDF files and OneNote, and you know, everything's online. You can you know, laptops are small and you know, things like that. And um, but well, there's stocks. still. Yeah, I guess like if it's, like, if it's documentation like, too, like it changes so frequently. Like it changes, yeah. yeah. And I think it's an old mindset from professors who like feel like they have to print these things to give it to the students, and or they don't trust the the technology piece with I don't know yep. um, when privacy I, um, or cheat, right? I worked for a public school district for thirteen years. Um, from like 1999 to, to through the through 2010, mm -hmm. and a couple years in there, as I'm doing the budget, I'm like, how much are we spending on ink cartridges for ink jets? Because yeah. every elementary school classroom had the had same at, thing. Yep. At least one inkjet printer. A lot of the middle school and high school did as well, and then also the offices might have had ink jets and stuff like that. Right. So I actually did the work to calculate this. We were spending between thirty and forty thousand dollars in 
ink cartridges a year. That's crazy. Right. So I, I went to the business um, superintendent Manager. and I said, I'm like, this is crazy. You know, like this could be used on better technology for our students and we're wasting it on ink and like a lot of it just goes bad. You know, yeah. because, you know, somebody forgot that not a lot, a percentage of it went bad because it sat in a box in a hot closet over a summer like that. Right. So with a with a, uh, a company, a printing company, I we basically consolidated pockets of pool pooled printers where, you know, yeah, your classroom thing is gone. If you need to have something in the classroom, it's going to be black and white laser. Um, and if you want to do color, you have to go to a lab and stuff right. like that and of course people screamed and shouted and all like people hated me for this but we went from spending 30 to forty thousand dollars a year on ink cartridges to like less than ten thousand yeah. on i had toner, toner. i had i had yeah. the same thing i when i was in the um k-12 school system and in my office um that was a shelf it looked like a it looked like staples really I had, you know, laser uh, ink cartridges. I had the the, the toners. I had the, all, all the different HP models for the, you know, the regular ink jets, you know, um, mm -hmm. like crazy stuff, you know, colors and black and whites. And, and then every now and then I'll get a teacher who'll stop by my office and say, oh, hey, I need an ink cartridge in my room. I'm like, oh, which one's that? So I'll have to look it up in my database. Oh, okay, here, this this the one. Or they'll send a student over. And then the student would come back. Hey, this didn't work because they they tried to shove it in, and it didn't. You know, they damaged it. So now, but each one of them cost anywhere from thirty to forty, forty, forty-five bucks, right? Yep. It was expensive. Mm -hmm. So this went on in almost every classroom. I'm like, okay, the adjoining classrooms, and yet again, and they have a door in between the classroom, and yet again, they all have like one or two printers in each. So I had the same discussion with my with the principals and stuff. I said, this is ridiculous. This all of this stuff is coming out from the IT budget. That's wrong. Number one, I said let's put the the financial ownership back to the teachers, and let's see how this plays out. And mm -hmm. sure enough, the moment we we turned it around, we said, hey, you guys are gonna buy your own stuff from your own your own budgets, and you know we're not gonna carry the stuff anymore. And the the, the consumption just dropped drastically. Interesting. Drop drastically. The uh, amount of paper we're using dropped drastically because now it's like it wasn't free anymore. So it, it you know, it was going to eat up from their whether they buy crayons or whether they buy, you know, other school supplies for their mm -hmm. classroom, or they spend you know, two hundred dollars on ink cartridges every two weeks or three weeks or whatever it was. Yeah. Yep. So for so, where I worked, it was already on the school. It wasn't in my budget. Oh, and I was just like, you know, it was just like, I'm like, this is, I'm like, I noticed a lot of inkjet printers and I'm like, what, why do we have so many? Like, what is going on? And then I'm like, that's when I discovered like, holy cow, this is yeah. crazy. And they always, they always bought all the ink cartridges over the summer. And then they sat around for the whole year. Oh yeah. And stuff. And they gunk up. But you know, one, one, one of the reasons why they have so many of these, these low cost uh, printers is because the community of people will use the schools to donate, right? Mm -hmm. So we used to get a lot of them, or even teachers would say, "Oh, hey, I got so and so, uh, you know, this my my students' uh, parents, you know, donated this printer, and can you hook it up? And oh, by the way, I'm going to need cartridges for it, whatever. And you're like, why did they give you this? Well, yeah. you know why? Because it's a tax write-off, and then they use it for their donations for their taxes. The parents do." Right. Mm -hmm. So we used to, that's why they keep getting on. Like, we got to stop. Stop taking this junk. Yeah. yeah. Before things got donated, I had to approve it. And okay. almost every time I'm like, sorry, no. Like, yeah. this is not usable. Like, you know, there's a reason you're trying to give it to us. So yeah. sorry. But, you know, is it a cost but, us to actually pay somebody to take it away? Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to cost the taxpayer back too if you take it. And yeah, it's like, you know, why, why are we trying to create this feedback loop? It doesn't make sense. Right. So yeah, we went from like hundreds of inkjet printers to a few laser printers with color in each building. And it was nice. It made ordering simpler. 
um, because there's always the same ink uh, toner, I mean. Right. Um, and at the high school, eventually what happened is we even reduced the printing footprint even further because they decided to, it was worth hiring a copy print person where if you had like a huge packet of stuff, you actually created a request formally to have it all printed out. And that's all they did. The whole day was printing out packets oh my goodness. for teachers and delivering it and stuff like that. And it was better than printing because the teacher didn't have to wait for the thing to come out. Right. So yeah, it was, it ended up being pretty cool. So um, I was really proud about that particular. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Small things. Um, the other thing that is um, other interesting news is about OneDrive. A couple of things that they new announcements this week. Um, one of them is the file vault. They yep. introduced right um, for Im for your important files. So I guess they're protected, they're encrypted, and things like that, right? Do you, do you know anything more about it? Or no, I read about it, and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool idea. Um, there's been a bunch of times where I just kind of <laughs> wanted to share something differently. You know, and then because I couldn't uh, just have this more secure, like, uh, you know, location, I used Dropbox or, yep. you know, Box or something like that because it had that feature already there. So. Yeah, Dropbox ha had, I've been using it. It's called a cryptid, cryptid folder or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm reading this um, um, OneDrive announcement from uh, Paul Turot. And it says it's an additional layer of security on OneDrive. It's almost like a two-factor authentication, but for, just for a single folder. So, right. you know, not only that you log in and to access your your data on OneDrive, but then when you want to access these things, you've got an ad additional um, uh, two-step verification for it or something like that. So, which is sure. pretty cool. Um, some people and I've got um, I've been using One OneNote. Um, and I've got, um, you know, uh, one of my uh, uh, pages, I guess, or, or sections is is uh, is uh, password protected. Um, so if I want to put some, I don't know, credit card information in there, something like that, I've got that. <clears throat> I know some cool. people use that as well. So you, you know, which is pretty a nice feature to to have. Yep, um, definitely. And the other announcement with OneNote, I mean, no, sorry, not OneNote, OneDrive is the they are doubling up on the standard storage plans um sweet yeah so it's gone up from i guess um yeah they, they're moving it up for like i think a couple of hundred gigs or something like that for for the price you pay so one one terabyte becomes two terabytes and things like that and um so that's pretty neat too so yeah i mean the cost of storage is ridiculously cheap right now so yeah. <laughs> like even just hard drives if you were yeah. buying so what's insane. interesting with all of this is that when you look at the big picture and you see other competing companies like dropbox and you know they not too long ago decided to up the ante too so they are you know increased it to two terabytes now from mm -hmm. the, the whatever you're paying because i pay for my uh dropbox i use it so much um and yeah, next thing I know, hey, no, we're giving you two terabytes and it's going to cost you, you know, the same or something like that. Sure. And you got more features too. Now you got that that um, that smart sync stuff where it doesn't download everything down to your local machine and fill up your hard drive. You know, now yep. you're just, you know, using what you use and and things like that and and clears out stuff that you haven't used in a, in X amount of time or or, or, or time frame. Yeah. So you know, you just. So it's pretty cool stuff. So now, you know, you can see OneDrive is doing, you know, kind of similar things all as well. Right. Yeah. So it's, what else you got? It's, it's nice to have competition because then you, right? Uh, the other thing um, I was going to mention is about, so last, was it last week or the week before? There were there were a couple of vulnerabilities by with uh, Firefox. Um, mm -hmm. and one came out and it was like an emergency. Hey, you know, please patch everybody, please patch and stuff like that. Um, and then a few days later, they, they discovered another vulnerability and then another patch came out for for Firefox. And then this week, um, there's an interesting one with uh, Dell. 
Uh, it's called a Dell Support Assist tool uh, that's installed on millions of, of, uh, of workstations, laptops, computers, and all that stuff. And that is got a major flaw in it. Um, and uh, so they, they put out an SOS to, oh boy, you know, download and install this, this patch. What people don't realize is that um, this Dell support assist thing uses, um, uh, I think it's uh, it's, a, it's something to do with PC Doctor. It's the same, you know, do you remember PC Doctor thing? Yeah, a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, something you know, something about that, and that 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 particular thing is is vulnerable. And um, got it. I know I've used this tool before because basically what it does is that when you go to you know Dell.com and whatever support, and you want to like, hey, what what is the configuration of my device, and you know what drivers do I need, and you know check for me, and then it downloads this little tool and installs, and that's basically what it is. Yep. So I, so I just, never install any of that kind of stuff on, on machines yeah. that I have to work on. Yeah. Nope. So, Makes me so nervous. Like you yeah, never know. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So yeah. I've I've used it before. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's just easier, but then then you know then I uninstall the stuff. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what I have uh, for for the security side of things. Oh, um, I did a uh, a cool webinar with um, Adaptiva last. No, actually, it was this week um, on uh, batching third-party applications. Okay. So I was one of, I think, uh, four, four or five of us, uh, including Anoop, um, uh, you know, who does a lot of config manager stuff. So all of us brought in different pieces of third-party application management, patching, and stuff like that. So I talked about supersedence, how to use a supersedence method to update. Uh, so sure. not a lot of people know about it, and you know the tab is there, but they don't know what it does and how to how to apply it. Got it. Um, so yeah, it went pretty well. That was cool. pretty good. Awesome. Yeah. So what else we got? Um, I saw something fly by either today or yesterday about a new version of Chrome OS that's going to be oh. rolling out. I'm not sure if it's a beta. Okay. Or not. Um, but what's interesting is they're adding USB support for um, Android devices that are plugged in um, and you're in the Linux subsystem where before you could not, um, you couldn't. So basically what this allows you to do is do some additional testing on Android devices that are attached to your Chromebook but you're using the Linux subsystem before those Linux subsystem. I'm calling it that because that's what they call it in Windows. Right. The Linux whatever uh, <laughs> system could not attach to the Android thing uh, device that was attached. Okay. Um, the Chromebook knew that it was there, but the Linux um, VM or container could not access okay. anything on it. Now it can. So that's going to be interesting to see how people are going to use that for some additional testing and oh, cool. stuff like that. This yep, almost sounds like uh, the the Windows Sandbox that's in uh, 1903 now, Windows 10 1903. Mm -hmm. Have you played with that? Nope, not at all. Have you? Yeah, so now it comes default. It was in the Windows inside of uh, builds, and now it's in 1903. It's basically like another VM that you just you know you enable this 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 feature. And then you you know you do a search for sandbox and it pops up, and you you literally see another. Um, it looks exactly like another VM, you know, running okay. Windows, and on your desktop, and you can use it to you know install applications and open up the browser and do things and you know all that fun stuff. And when you close it, it just everything goes away. It just wipes it. So gotcha. it's it's contained within this container. In this and in um, in this virtual container, so it doesn't affect your your actual system and stuff like that. So really okay. cool stuff. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so anything cool that you've uh, eaten lately? Man, anything cool that I've eaten lately, dude? I'm totally digging the Indian, <laughs> uh, new Indian place right next to us at oh, the office. I've been guys. eating way too much food over there. Oh, but cool. other than that. Um, I haven't had anything new. Okay. Which is sad. So, you know, yeah. 
we are we're gonna do some a little hosting on Fourth of July, and you know we always go to the parade in the in my in my town and stuff like that. And then uh, we normally go to the relatives and you know whatever, and after the fact and and have like barbecue and stuff like that. So they say we're like, hey, why don't we have it at our house? We got the pool, we got this, and we'll bring have the relatives come over. Okay, fine. And then I've got this Indian coworker who's who's kind of working with us temporary, and. Uh, him and his wife and their little baby and and um, so I said, hey, you know, well, well, I'll invite them as well. So okay, fine. So they're gonna come over and and uh, so my wife was like, you know, what do we what do we fix and all that stuff and you know and I said, well, you know, I think they they'll probably bring a dish or something, so that'll be pretty cool. And I said, you know what, I'll fix. You can fix your hot dogs and stuff, but I'll I'll make some tandoori chicken. You know, because I've made it before, you know, you just rub the spices and all that stuff and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So I'll have to remember to marinate it a day before something like that. And Do you have the pot for that? The oven, I mean? No. Are you I, make I it in the regular this, oven? Okay. Yeah. So you get this special powder, this called tandoori powder. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you, you know, you use that, you use some yogurt, like white, uh, plain yogurt. Yep. Mix it all up and, you know, the, that's your marinade, your marinade and, um, and then I just I just use a barbecue. It just comes out just good. Yeah. Cool. So I'm something I l- something I learned from my parents on making um, barbecue chicken or in the, even in the oven is, you know, like Indian spices. They don't. Um, they, it's very hard for them to get them to attach to <clears throat> the meat, right? Right. Um, because when because because they're so tiny and so what my dad started doing when we were little is he he would buy shake and bake which is this packet of like a lot of that and he would add all all the spices in there that he would get at the indian store in new york city and of course there was a patel brothers and shake up all the spices in there and all the spices would attach to the whatever that stuff was and then you put that on the chicken and it would stay on for like the barbecue grill. It never fell off into the thing um, and it didn't get stuck to the grill and stuff like that. And then wow. if you're baking it in the oven, it was incredible um, because you put the, uh, you cover the chicken in the um, baking dish with foil, which keeps all the moisture in. So it's like self marinating. Okay, you, okay. you don't have to marinate or anything like that. It just worked. And um, the reason they did that is because, you know, in order to do it uh, the tandoori way, it just takes so much time. So okay. this was like an easy way out. Yep. Speaking of shake and bake, I, this is, is in my many, many, many years ago, my wife used to buy boxes of that. And that's, we used to make, you know, chicken or pork or something, put it in the bag and shake it. <laughs> yep. I totally forgot about it. I can't believe it. And uh, yeah, so things like that. Um, uh, I've been trying some different restaurants in my you know, my little town. Some new stuff will pop up or whatever. And That's cool. I've been like hitting one of those Nepali places. I love the Nepali noodles. You know, uh, they call it Nepali chow mein or something like that. And, okay. and they all have it. They all have it. It's it's their way of cooking it and spicy and all that stuff. And yeah, it's cool. Sweet. So, and hey, so you know my daughter Sabrina. She watches every single one of our shows. Oh and boy. The other day I, I saw her just, just recently and she's like, Dad, I can't believe prayer. She said, he goes to bed so early. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I was like, oh, yeah, you do watch our shows. <laughs> so she was like, really? He does. He says, she says he goes to bed by nine. And like, yeah, I know, but he's up at 430 or four o'clock or whatever. Yeah, dude, but here's what happened. My wife last week, um, she it's she asked this year that if she could just get a, away for a week. Um, okay. I'm like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. she she went abroad uh, to Europe with her sister and a friend, and I was home with twins yes. and my oldest daughter. So the twins are three and a half, and the oldest is nine. Okay. And holy cow. <laughs> oh my God. Mm-hmm. I mean, you saw my Twitter feed. I was like, this is freaking crazy. Right. So the level number one, I have to say like, like I have so much more respect for single parents because yes. I had no idea how rough it, it is. This, 
you know, I mean, it's not the same because my wife came back, but I'm like, holy cow, how can they do this 24 Imagine hours? Imagine if you went away for two weeks or, or whatever. You know? Yeah, that's not happening ever. Um, not <laughs> until, But the thing that made this really difficult is that they are in the middle of potty training. <laughs> and like we were just kind of like doing it casually and stuff like that. But like when I realized like, oh, my God, like, you know, we can't go anywhere unless I know that they've gone to the bathroom. So yes. every hour I'm taking them to the little potty. I'm like, all right, you got to go potty. And they did every freaking hour. And so that monotony, oh, <laughs> I was like starting to lose it. But one of them is pretty much fully potty trained now. Oh, she nice. like even in the morning, like the, her uh, her nighty is not even wet. Like it's nice. just and one of them just doesn't care. She's like, oh, oh, I don't know. I'm a little kid. I'm going to be a little kid as long as I want. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my but man. God. Yeah. So because of that, at the end of the day, I was like, exhausted. You know, I was exhausted. I'm like, I need to unwind. And so I would watch Netflix yeah. until yeah. like 10, 30, 11. And then I'd go to bed and I'd wake up at seven o'clock, which is a little bit before they got up. So I got to get back into the routine. Like it's already 940 now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. in a, it, like starting on Sunday, I think I'm going to be back on that schedule of early okay. bedtime and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, Still getting I, seven I, hours. I don't, I don't know how you get up so early. Oh, my God. It's the well, only time I get up that early or even at three o'clock is when I have to catch a flight. You know, an early flight. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I'm still getting the right amount of sleep. Oh, it's yeah. not like I'm getting less sleep. I'm getting no. actually more. Right. Um, and there's been a lot of talk lately about what um, the importance of getting the right amount of oh, sleep yeah. is. Absolutely true. Yeah. Um, and how it affects when how it, it affects your brain and how it will affect you when you're older, how you're sleeping now. Right. So I'm like, all right, I need to be more diligent about that. You know, just as eating is good and being active is good and right, right. stuff like that. Oh, that's so, good. I'm I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah. So, I just like I feel like I go to bed late and then I try to get up late. You know, especially on weekends. I'm like, uh, why? You know, you're yeah. getting up every uh, very early every day for for work and it's like, uh, why? And then, but then by the time I get up in a, on the weekends, I'm like, I should have got up a little earlier. You know, because now I'm missing part of the morning and oh, you know, I could have done yeah. So sometimes you regret, yeah. Here's the cool thing about getting up early, though. On weekends, all that time is yours. It's true. You don't have to go to work. Um, yeah. Everybody else is asleep. Like, you can literally do whatever you want. And I'm not one to go to stores and go shopping and stuff like that. Right. I want right. to read. I want to, you know, work on art and stuff like that. Um, or just, you know, take pictures and things like that. And so I'm like, this is my time. I don't have to ask anybody or make sure everybody's taken care of because like everybody is sleeping. So yeah. yeah. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Yep. I, I get sounds a lot fun. more done uh, yeah. with this with this pattern. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. All right. I think we covered a lot today. So yep, we should uh, save some for the next next episode. <laughs> sounds good to me. And uh, all right. So until next time, thanks for watching. And uh, I'm Hodget. You'll find me on Twitter as uh, at Hooch, H O O R G E. Cool. And my name is Prayer. You can find me on Twitter at the IT Jedi and also on Instagram at the IT Jedi. Cheers. See y'all. <laughs>